So uh, welcome everybody um, at uh, the, we call it the DIY workshop for the uh, Drone Racing Club is our sponsor and um, Funfly FPV, that's me. And we're doing a DIY workshop for let's build a, dra a racing drone. So um, a little bit uh, about ourselves. Um, we are... Um, the DRC, and that's the Drone Racing Club, of, um, and we're based in Atlanta at the moment. And, um, you know, so, uh, um, and me, myself, I'm uh, Funfly FPV, or Vivian Van Zyl is my name. And um, I um, have been flying for a while. I'm not a, a super expert at this, but I'm going to try and convey some of the information here to you. We have a Todd Wall with us too, and he's uh, from the DRC. <laughs> and um, we're going to have Todd um, also um, assist where we can. Um, we uh, have a few uh, um, uh, items we want to cover. So um, today, basically, if we can swap over to our um, little... Um, presentation over here we um, will be doing uh, first of all our introductions and that's what we just did and then we're going to go through what is FPV just a quick what it uh, what it is because that seems to be a problem uh, you know if you don't understand what that is then you know tough it's tough to get started you know and then uh, what is this session about and then just watch a multi-rotor. So this is just a short introduction on these basic concepts that we want to cover. And then um, after that, we're going to move on to the actual build. And um, that's where we're going to try and build this quadcopter that uh, we have over here. Um, and um, I have a camera that shows onto it over here. And we're going to try and build this quadcopter for you. So, um, so there's a, a, what are we building? And then we, we're going to go through all the parts. We're going to go through the frame. We're going to go through the power and the ESCs and the motors and the battery. We're going to go through the flight controller. We're going to go through the receiver. And we're going to go through the actual FPV gear. Just to give you a, a total overview of what this is and how to build it. Okay, so uh, I think um, we already gave a little bit of a, um, a, a piece here about who we are and who the DRC is. Todd, maybe you want to introduce the DRC a little bit more? Yeah? Okay. Um, uh, so the DRC is a drone racing club and it's established to help promote uh, and proliferate uh, FPV as a sport. Uh, that's first person view drone racing as a sport. Also, uh, we're trying to uh, get people together to fly uh, in safe and responsible ways. So it's an outlet for those hobbyist enthusiasts, uh, those that like competition, and those that want to uh, potentially pursue a commercial career in drones. It's a great place to get together and meet people and uh, learn uh, what's new about drones, so. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Okay, so um, that's a DRC. And again, I'm a part of a DRC. I'm one of a, a club members and um, a director. And um, so um, let's jump right in and, and talk quickly about what is FPV. And uh, we have a five minute limit on this. <laughs> But um, here's Todd's words about what is FPV. FPV, or first person view, uh, drone racing combines several different technologies such as drone, multi rotor, helicopter, and fixed, fixed wing planes. And lots of us have flown these kind of things, you know, little planes and RC planes. But uh, today we're talking about multi rotors. But we, uh, remote control, live video, microcontrollers, and a variety of different sensors. So. FPV combines all of those things and give you specifically this thing called live video. This is what we're interested in. And that really is what FPV is. It takes all of this technology and make it possible for you to see live video. 
Okay? This allows the operator of a drone to fly the aircraft with precision in close proximity. And it's important, the close proximity part, because we can go, you know, depending on the size of your, of your quadcopter, you can go as small as this to as big as this, um, fitting through gaps, you know, in this room, if you want to be that close proximity. So, um, and of course, to the ground, we're not talking close proximity, you know, hundreds of feet up like normal aircraft. aircraft. Um, and usually below the tree line and less than 100 feet. So that's where we usually fly. We don't like flying higher than that. Of course, it's possible. But for an FPV multi-rotor, -ro especially in the racing world, he would never go over 100 feet. It doesn't make sense to even do that. So um, it's really close proximity. And then we go around co obstacles and we view um, these uh, uh, um, obstacles or, or the course via our um, goggles. And, you know, if we want to look at an example of goggles, would pr probably be something like this. Let me get that swapped over quickly so I can give you a uh, view there. There is an example of a monitor. Uh, FPV monitor, so that would be one way to do this. And uh, another possible way would be to do it via um, what's referred to as, commonly referred to as goggles, and it would be something like this, which are FPV goggles. Uh, typically a brand called Fat Shark is, is very well known in that area. And um, so um, that's the goggles. And of course, you'd view it, you know, you'd, you'd view your video through these little um, uh, uh, viewfinders or, or, or view uh, monitors, if you want to put it that way, inside. So that's how the pilot views it. Uh, but to make that happen, of course, a lot of things have to happen. Um, so, and um, as it says here, the, cockpit, the, the pilot has the point of view of a pilot's cockpit aboard the drone, so on board the drone. So what it basically means is you're flying and um, you're viewing as if you were inside the quadcopter or inside the machine. So to make all of that happen, and that's what we're going to talk about, is building a, a machine that makes all of this happen so that you can actually be flying inside of this machine. So that's, that's the, the goal of today, is building you one of these so that you can actually uh, be a pilot on board, if that makes sense. Okay, so, and that's what the session is about. Uh, we'll be building a racing quadcopter when you'll be able to race quadcopter races. So what is a quadcopter race? A quadcopter race is basically a bunch of quad, uh, um, FPV pilots that fly these drones that they can view through their monitor or goggles, and they fly them around obstacles or a preset course to um, uh, um, uh, race, same as you would race um, cars or, or, or you know, um, there's a preset course and we'll follow that and we'll avoid obstacles like gates and flags and we have to go around them. Um, so using this quadcopter, you'll be able to do that. And that's what a, a, a basically a quadcopter race is. So um, next, let's talk about what is a multi-rotor and where does the word multi-rotor come from? So. We look at a, a few examples here and we see a word quadcopter and we see a word hexacopter. And we talk about sizes. So when we talk about these, typically quad meaning four, would be any machine that contains four propellers or rotors. Um, it's important to know uh, um, that some machines may contain an extra rotor at the bottom and that, you know, so um, it's four motors makes it a quadcopter, 
But if it, you know, if it has motors down the bottom, then it turns into an octocopter because it doubles the quad. Okay, hexacopter of course is six, and um, so six propellers, and that keeps it, uh, you know, afloat. So um, there's various makes and models, as many as you can count of them. On this screen, we're looking at the MXP 230. We're looking at the Hobby King Long Frame 250. We're looking at a More Fight 180. We're looking at the Nero 180, and we're looking at the RCX Hex. Um, how do I know this? Because uh, I built all of these. Uh, first of all, <laughs> but second of all, um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, how do I know the sizes? Well, it's typically measured from one end to the other end, or, um, diagonally across from one motor to the other motor. So, you know, in the case of an MXP 230, from here to here will be 230 millimeters. In the case of a Nero 180 or a, or a Morphite 180, the distance from that motor to that motor is 180. So that makes it a different class. There, this one here is a 250, so the, um, 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 you know, the Hobby King 250, that will be 250 millimeter. And this guy is measured across like this, and that's 330 in, in this specific hex here. So this is in a size 330, a size 250, 2180s, and a 230. So the classification is typically, you know, uh, uh, 250 and above, so um, uh, almost 200 and above, and uh, below 200, or the 180 class, and then above 300. So there are three different classes here. This one happens to be a hexacopter, and those are all quadcopters. And that's the most common we work with are quadcopters. So we will also be building a quadcopter that looks similar to this one, uh, MXP 230. So any questions on sizes and, and nobody? Okay. Okay, so um, we're going to move into the actual build now. If they do ask questions, I would just get them to roll out. Yeah. Like yeah. Time, yeah. Hey, you yeah. For the end. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise you'll never finish. I know. <laughs> I know. So, so that's the end of that section. We're still doing good, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so what we're building. This picture is supposed to be a picture of a completed one of these, but. Um, so the finished product, and let me swap over to the finished product here, um, if I can. This um, is the finished product. That's what we actually want to build. Um, we'll see that it is a um, quadcopter, meaning it has four motors. This one is actually in the size 280. So from here, for diagonally across the, uh, the, the, the frame is 280 millimeters. It's a carbon fiber frame and it has a CC3D on board and a FPV camera. And we'll go through all those parts um, in, in the next few minutes here or the next uh, half an hour or so. So um, important things to, to talk here are about the frame. So here is a incomplete frame and if we look at the frame um, so what's important about the frame there are many 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 different sizes as we just discussed but there's also many materials a frame is made out of this specific frame is made out of carbon fiber if you can see it like that so that is a what's known as a carbon fiber frame there's also um, G10, and there's also wood, and there's also aluminum. Um, nowadays, the, the preferred for a racer would be carbon fiber. The reason is this thing weighs next to nothing. It is very light. I, I don't have the exact weight here, but it is about 100 and something grams. Very light. But the carbon fiber makes it almost indestructible. I say almost. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, almost. <laughs> not, not the way I fly. But 
So um, the other thing about the frame is, so apart from the material that we have here, is uh, the shape. This guy is in, in the form of an H shape, and that's also the more common today, is it's in the form of an H, meaning it's a longer uh, chassis with the four motors coming out the side. Now, uh, you can also get the, the normal X formation, and, um, you know, uh, um, there's, a, there's a few more variants on that, but this is by far the most common uh, uh, um, uh, shape, is to have it in an H shape. Okay, so on a frame like this, the other thing that we'll look at are the mounting options. On, um, you know, there's mounting options on this specific frame for a camera, a FPV camera in front, and that's what we want. It has a mounting option at the back here for a battery. It's typically a battery that looks like this, would be mounted over there. And uh, it has mounting options for a high definition camera, which is something like that, a run cam on top. And like I said, the FPV camera inside there. So this, this specific frame has many mounting options and makes it very, um, you know, um, a, 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 a very good, easy to use frame. There's, of course, once you get to the smaller sizes, like the 180, the space allotted for mounting things gets smaller. And thus we say this is a very good size to start at, a 280. Um, rather start with a size where there's ample space for those things than to try and make your first build a 180 where there's almost no space. Everything has to fit perfectly. So it's, so it's much better to start with this guy. So um, on here is, of course, another factor on this is what size propellers this machine can take. So the specific quadcopter, here is a 50, 30, or okay, a uh, 40, 45 bullnose prop. Now that's a very small propeller, and if we were to put it on a motor, we'd see that it would fit this quad can take that. Here is a 5-inch uh, prop. That was a 4-inch prop. There's a 5-inch prop. We'll see that this quadcopter would easily, it clears, and it would easily take that. And here is a 6-inch prop. And we'll see that this frame would even support 6-inch props. So that's another consideration. Um, here's another example of, and this is a tri-blade 5-inch uh, prop. And, um, you know, propellers are, you know, there's a whole world we can discuss about propellers. Um, you know, I'm not going to particularly go, go too deep into it, but it's typically measured um, with the, 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 the length, and that's a 4-inch, 5-inch, and 6-inch, and then the pitch, and that's how much pitch there is. So um, this quadcopter, um, I would say, would work pretty well. A four inch would be too small for it. A five inch would be perfect, five or a six inch. And depending on the motor you're talking, uh, uh, the size of your motors will determine whether what pitch would be best for you. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to put a huge pitched prop on a small motor because you'll overpower the motor or you'll, you'll burn the motor with, if you're drawing too much power. So, but, of course, a higher pitch prop gives you more lift. There's a whole formula that, that we work out. But, uh, um, and, and, and we'll share that information um, with some links afterwards where you can actually go, go work that out. So on these guys, really, um, I would say for this quadcopter, a 5-inch or a 6-inch prop would be perfect. So that's on the props. And then um, we spoke about the cameras. Okay, so we looked at the material, we looked at the mounting option, we looked at the nuts and bolts. This uh, frame also has some standoffs, what's known as standoffs. These are aluminum standoffs. It has some bolts at the bottom, uh, which are typically uh, aluminum or, or plastic to make it light. So um, all of those things play into the, and we looked at the cameras. Okay. 
So let's start looking at the, the electronics first of all. We're going to talk here about the motors and um, let's quickly um, discuss the motors. So here's um, two sizes of motors. This is the motor that comes with this quadcopter and that is a 1806 motor. There is another motor which looks similar but is much smaller and that is a 1306 motor. So a motor typically is measured in its um, a, a, a thickness, radius. radius, that's the word, radius. So that's 18 and this is a 13. And then the second part, the 06 part, is the height. So this motor is a 06, and that motor is also a, an 06. So they equal height, but they are their radius is smaller. This one's a 13 millimeter. This one's an 18 millimeter. And then, um, if we look at this quad, this has actually got a 2204 on it, meaning um, this guy has a 22 millimeter radius, but its height is only 04 and not 06. So that makes it, um, so that's how you work out the motors. That's what those numbers mean. In actual fact, it took me many motors of buying before I had that knowledge. Because you just look at these numbers and you're like, what does it mean? What does it even mean? You know, so, um, so typically a small motor like this, a 13 motor, you wouldn't want to run more than a four inch prop on it. That's the, very good size for a 13, uh, a, 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 a 13 size motor. The next motor up is typically an 18 size motor and there you can do typically a 5 inch prop. That is good for an a, a 18 size motor. Uh, a 5 inch prop works good and for a big guy like this, a 22 motor, a 6 inch prop works good. But as you can see on this specific frame, it cannot take 6 inch props and thus um, you have to put a 5 inch with a bigger pitch on that. This frame can take a, a 6 inch prop. So that's a little bit about the motors. Uh, the motors typically has three wires that come out and um, it is a brushless motor. Um, it's not a very complicated piece of equipment. Uh, basically, um, and I'll show you the ESC next, all it does is put voltage on each one of these pins at a very high speed and that just turns the motor as the, mag uh, as the magnets inside uh, swap. Uh, you know, of course the motor tries to follow. So that's just a little bit on the motors. Then the next piece of equipment is called the ESC. Now ESC is that uh, a machine and if you look at the little picture over here get a little picture for you. If you look at the little picture, so we just discussed the motors over here. The next thing down is called the ESC. And the ESC, and there you'll see the little three little wires from the motors. And um, the ESC basically turns voltage, you know, 12 volts or how many volts we put in there. And on this ESC is a little computer and I'll show you now how the, the main flight controller will actually tell this ESC what um, revolution or what speed it needs the motor to turn at. So to every motor, there is this thing called a ESC that controls every motor speed. So that's basically our quad. And of course, on a hexacopter and all those, there's eight of those the more complex you get, but every motor has to have an ESC that tells the motor what to do. The powering loom is as simple as this. Uh, you can do this with a power distribution board, but it really is, every one of these ESCs will need power from the main battery, a negative and a positive power, um, so that they are all powered. And they will convert that power into um, uh, um, something the motor understands. So here, um, if we look closer at a ESC, there is a 
tiny, it's a, called a Biel Heli ESC. Uh, um, uh, and it's Biel Heli, it's called Biel Heli because um, on this ESC there is a processor. There's a tiny processor there. And that processor runs software. And um, of course, there's many versions of software, and many people write software for these things. Nowadays, we standardize on BL Heli or Simon K. But um, the software that runs on that processor is what um, the main flight controller would talk to. So the flight controller would instruct this processor over here what to do with the motor that's connected to these three wires. So um, if we go back to this drawing over here, um, these ESCs. So if we go to the next picture, and this is where the, the flight controller gets into, uh, into play, is there's a single wire, or it was actually two wires, and I always call it a network. There's actually a protocol that runs across these green wires from the flight controller to each one of these ESCs. So what's important here is the flight controller has a main processor on, and think of it as a computer network. So the main flight controller has a processor on, and each one of these ESCs has a processor. So this is actually a multi-processor computer, if you look at it that way, that's connected via a network. So the main processor will instruct one of the smaller processors on the motors to, you know, speed up motor number one. So um, the instruction will come from the software that runs on here via that two-wire serial interface into the, that processor. They network together. This processor will, in turn, uh, using its internal software, uh, turn the motor faster. So that's really what they, a, uh, how they actually um, connect together. So a, um, a flight controller typically looks something like, like this. And this specific uh, flight controller is called a CC3D. And a CC3D is a, is a pretty well known, it's by Open Pilot. The other very well known at the moment is the NAS32 or um, the NAS processor. But what it basically is, is you'll see the wires over here. And this is where each one of the ESCs will plug into. It's numbered over here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, this one is numbered up to six. So it can take six ESCs, will plug into here. And again, here's a ESC and it's two wire um, uh, uh, coming out um, and it would typically plug in there and it has polarity so uh, we'll work on, on, on that but that's typically what uh, how they connect together so if you're looking at the wiring loom it would typically look like this there's our four ESC's like it is in the drawing each one of the ESC's the positives and the negatives are all connected together onto the battery plug so the battery, all of them together, so it provides power to each one of these ESCs. The, every, each one of these ESCs has the three wires coming out, and that, those are the ones that go to the motors. Now, one thing on that is, you know, a motor has, to, has a spin direction, and typically um, every piece of software uh, um, or, or version or, or um, board once the motor to spin in a specific direction. You should look at your um, documentation on that. And um, based on that, you will actually uh, um, change the spin direction. And that's done by swapping two of the wires. So if you've, if you've wired this up and your motor is spinning clockwise and you want it to spin anti-clockwise, all you have to do is really just swap two of these wires. Nowadays, it can also be done in software, but that's the hardware way of doing it. You swap two of the motors, or two of the wires, and then um, it will spin the other direction. So that's our wiring loom over here, uh, connecting our ESCs. 
And again, back to uh, our flight controller. So if we look at our flight controller, here's our flight controller, and we'll, you note that I'll put a, a little positive and a negative in there. These specific ESCs we're using here are called opto ESCs. Now opto ESC means if you look at the wires that come out of ESC, there's actually three of them. And there's a negative, a positive, and a signal wire. If you look at a, uh, a, a another form of ESC, this is an opto, and it really has only two wires, a ground and a signal wire. So in this case, this ESC does not provide power. This ESC is not an opto and provides power, and thus we can actually power our flight controller off this ESC. And that's what it basically means. It just says, I'm converting um, the, the, the 12 volts you turn into me. I will give you also a 5 volt line out. So um, the other two wires that's important, of course, is, or the other wire that's important is a signal wire. And that's a serial wire we just spoke about, which um, is this one over here that connects the, uh, is, is the networking wire, if you want to put it that way. So just know that you can uh, provide voltage, 5 volt, to your flight controller either via a, uh, a separate source or typically via ESC's um, power output. It does provide that 5 volts for you. So um, just going through here then, we've got uh, uh, powering the flight, con the flight controller, powering microprocessors. So what's on the flight controller and how does it work? It's, um, it has various sensors like a accelerometer and some have even barometers and and what it basically means is if you look at a picture like this and and that's the quadcopter on this flight controller there's a sensor let's say you want the, f the, the quadcopter to move forward and you instruct the flight controller hey move the quadcopter forward what the, uh, the flight controller will in turn do is let via its network, let these two processors know that it needs to spin the back two motors up and these motors will provide more power uh, or, or provide more lift. The, the quadcopter will go into a tilt and move forward. Um, there's also then a, a piece of software on here that's running the whole time that will say, well, you let go of the sticks, I need to level the, the craft and it will provide a little bit more power to the motors in front and thus leveling it. So know that inside of this flight controller there is a constant constant um, uh, uh, um, a piece of software running and that could be uh, NASE or it could be open pilot um, or clean flight or base flight. There's, there's many of those soft pieces of software that you can load onto your flight controller and its job is to basically control this using its um, sensors like the accelerometer and, um, and, and knowing whether the craft is level. So know that when a quadcopter actually hovers in, in the air there is millions of calculations happen, happening every second for that to, to, to take place. Uh, the flight controller over here giving instructions via its network to all these motors uh, telling them to, you know, if a sudden gust of wind were to push the quadcopter, uh, you know, sideways, the flight controller will sense it. It will tell these two motors to give a little bit more thrust and bring the, the quadcopter back level. So um, there's a lot of stuff that happens there. And then um, the other thing that's important here is like I mentioned earlier, every uh, um, piece of software has a motor order. It's best to uh, uh, look at the, at the, um, the specific uh, um, software installation. And, um, and that more motor order will determine where you plug in your motors or your ESCs to the flight controller. So that's very important. Okay, so... Um, now let's quickly talk about the receiver. And this is the guy that you would use to um, send instructions to the flight controller. 
So, um, oops. so a, um, again, there's a myriad of these around. This specific one is a fairly cheap one. It's called a fly sky. And you'll see it as an antenna on one side. Typically, all of them have an antenna or maybe two antennas. That makes a diversity. We'll talk about that in a second. But on the other side is um, a one set of wires or several sets of wires that connects up to a flight controller. And typically, those connect up to one of these ports. So what is the job of this guy? Well, this guy pairs up with this thing, and that's called your radio. So the basic flow is your radio, um, let's say you want to give more throttle, you would lift, and this is a mode 2 radio, so you would give more the input for more throttle. That command will then travel via the antenna, the air antenna, to the RC receiver over here, the well, RC receiver will in turn convert that into a signal. It will feed into the flight controller. And if we go back to our picture, there's our radio sending the signal into the receiver. Receiver again puts it into the flight controller. And the flight controller, again, like our previous picture, converts that into something to tell the motors. So again, if we wanted to move forward, for instance, we will, or more thrust, we will push the stick up on the left. It will travel via radio into the receiver. The receiver will tell the flight controller. The pilot wants the aircraft to, to, to go up higher or, or, or uh, increase altitude. The flight controller, in turn, will tell each one of the ESCs to provide more power or more thrust to move a quadcopter higher. So that's the whole flow of how this is actually controlled. We're still doing okay there? Yeah. Yeah. 47 minutes is what you have. Okay, we've got about five more minutes of, of things. So, yep. So, um, so that's the flow. Um, uh, one thing uh, about RC receiver, of course, there's a myriad of them. I've shown you a Fly Sky over here, which is a very cheap model. You get much more advanced models than that. Here's a, a Fly Sky, pretty mine, cheap. Mine's not advanced, so don't show <laughs> yeah, you get uh, uh, you, you you get a lot of uh, a lot of different ones, and the reason why you get a lot of different ones is the range on this guy is maybe 500 feet. But then you get radios, once you get into LRS, it can go 20 miles. So, um, you know, the, the, the cost there, of course, increases, and the complexity. You know, this radio is a six-channel radio, meaning I can send six different signals to the receiver. A more expensive radio maybe has 12, so um, I can tell the receiver to, to uh, um, you know, 12 different functions and you know maybe I want to add lights and I want to add landing gear and all sorts of stuff so um, you know and I can send the instruction because now I have 12 channels I can send to the uh, to the flight controller or 12 knobs or or switches on my controller and now I can make more things but in a racing quadcopter six is more than enough um, you'll use um, uh, um, you know throttle uh, um, pitch, roll, and yaw are four. Those you must have. And then typically there's two more for mode. You can tell the software to go into a different configuration perhaps so that it's more aggressive. Your flying style is more aggressive. And then you have another channel maybe to turn lights on or, for, you know, or, or maybe trigger a beeper. I typically use the six one to, to trigger a beeper. You know, if I crash into the bushes over there, I need to go find the quadcopter. And so um, I typically trigger a beeper of the of last one. So, and a beeper uh, typically, we can quickly just talk about that. Goodness, I need to have these things laid out better. Yes, 
where I had it in there. there. A beeper typically looks like something like that, which is just a little um, beeping device that plugs into a channel on your flight controller or your receiver. And then you can, um, you know, if it's into your receiver, you can tell your receiver to, um, um, you know, for, for, for instance, channel number five or six, you can tell it to activate that and the beeper will go start beeping. So that's typically where beeper comes in. Or another accessory, which you'll see even on this quadcopter, is a um, battery voltage monitor. And um, here's one, a standalone one. And all that this does is it gives you um, audible feedback on, um, on your battery voltage. So if we were to um, connect a battery like this to there, we'd uh, see nothing. If we plug it in this way, we'd see something and it says it's a three cell. And it says this battery is on 11 volts. So there's a, a whole section on batteries. I'm not going to go much into it. But typically, you'd carry one of these on the quadcopter as well. So um, I think I strayed a little bit from where we were. So um, that's control and flow. Now, of course, this machine or this uh, flight controller talks to your receiver. It does so typically on a racing quadcopter on a 2.4 gigahertz band. Um, and that's the, the, the actual frequency. So. Um, do you, uh, uh, um, you know, in, in, in this world, they've, uh, they've solved a lot of problems for us. You know, imagine if, if everybody, like in the old days, there was only 10 channels and um, everybody could turn on their controller and be on the same channel. So while you're happily flying, somebody turns on his controller and hits throttle or whatever and your quadcopter disappears. So in, in the world of uh, control, a lot of those problems have been solved and the 2.4 gigahertz and these things are actually uh, running a, a special code. Uh, you go through a, a binding process of binding the two and there's a special code that goes. So there's actually a computer network between the two and if an instruction is given, it's preceded with the code. So only this receiver will, when it receives the, the, the request, it will understand that it's only for it. It's only its receiver telling it to go f higher or give more throttle. Now this problem, the reason I'm telling you this, this problem has not been solved on the video side of things. And we'll get there still. So, and that's what I call security. Um, once this controller is, is paired up with that receiver, they basically, only this receiver will listen to this controller. Um, but that problem um, is something we need to solve still in the video side of things. So talking about the video side of things, this is the last piece to the puzzle, and this is where um, the FPV gear comes into play. So uh, looking at the FPV, it's made up of obviously a camera, and it's typically what's known as a, a board camera. And again, there are myriads of of cameras you can do or use. Um, we typically prefer a, uh, um, a run cam, and it's called the PZ420. That's sort of an industry standard. Here is a, a cheaper version of a camera, and a board camera. And this guy is called a, a CC CCD video camera, no name from the from China. So, um, but that's typically what a board camera looks like. And it would typically f um, uh, mount at the front of a quadcopter. So we'll show you how that all goes together. And um, there it is. Uh, sorry, there it is in front. It's mounted. It's a board camera. And you'll mount it with a few screws or, 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 or the mounting gear. And that's your main FPV camera. So um, if you were to come to the drawing again, that is this main FPV camera in front. There'll be a wire that runs to the thing at the back, and that's called your FPV transmitter. Now, FPV transmitter typically 
looks like this. Here's a fat shark FPV transmitter. Here is the wire that comes from the camera. That's typically the input wire from the camera, the FPV camera. And here's some voltage. So typically what you want to do is you want to isolate, you know, this, uh, um, like, like I also show in the drawing over here, you want to almost isolate your FPV from the rest of a function. So um, you see you draw power directly from the battery over here into the FPV gear, and that's sort of an add-on on top of everything else. You don't want to intermix the power and intermix the signals, although you can. This is the safest way to do it by, you know, building a quadcopter and then adding. And the only thing really it has in common with the rest of a machine is it connects to the same battery. You can run it off your own battery, separate battery, but then, you know, voltage, uh, weight and all that thing comes into place. So what's the function of this FPV transmitter? Really, it transmits the signal to the goggle of a viewing device. And that's what the pilot views. So, um, so uh, um, again, we have a camera, we have a transmitter, we have uh, the goggles, and the frequency this works at typically today and most racing quadcopters is 5.8 gigahertz. And 5.8 gigahertz um, uh, um, and there's about uh, 32 or 40 channels available on the 5.8 gigahertz uh, band that we use. But um, I made a note here that says no security. So unlike in the previous example where we spoke about the 2.4 gigahertz where um, it's actually a network and there's a code, um, that problem has not been solved yet in the video signal. So um, there's only 40 channels available, and if you're out at the field and somebody is on the same channel as you and he flies in front of you, your goggles is going to switch over to looking at his quadcopter and instead of your quadcopter. So that is a big concern we have, and that's why our races at the moment have to be very controlled. You can't just go there and turn on your, your quadcopter or your, you can turn on your quadcopter but you cannot turn on your video transmitter because a pilot might be flying through the, uh, of the gates over there and you turn yours on and, and, and the next thing he sees is your camera and, and, and uh, you know, uh, and uh, he, he has no control over his aircraft at that point because he's seeing your view and he doesn't even know where his aircraft is. So that's very important. Another um, important part why we isolate this a lot like this is this word called latency. The time from uh, image entering the camera to it viewed on the uh, 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 pilot's um, display uh, should be less than uh, um, 100 milliseconds. So um, it's a, a, you know, if, if it's more than that, you know, the, <laughs> you can't have a latency of several seconds because by the time the pilot sees that he's going to hit the tree, he's actually already hit the tree. So that's another important part and why it's also higher frequency. It can take a, uh, um, it can, it can do, do more data, but there, there, you know, there's some issues there that we're still working through. So, but the basic idea of this is image enters the camera, goes through the transmitter, sent to the goggles and the pilot can see. So um, the last thing then, um, and that's your FPV camera over here. Um, we just looked at it. And then typically on all these quadcopters I showed earlier, there's, uh, you will see a, a thing called a Runcam or a Mobius or a, um, uh, um, what's the thing called, a uh, GoPro. GoPro. Typically those cameras go on top. But those cameras typically are not used for this FPV experience because these cameras record in high definition. So uh, by the time you know this camera is finished saving the high definition image and want to send that to the goggles, the latency is too much. So these cameras are typically on, on all quadcopters, but they, they're only to record the flight. Uh, it typically takes a little SD card 
uh, it has a slot at the back, SD card slot. So um, these cameras, the GoPros and all that that are on the quadcopter are there for recording, um, you know, uh, of a high definition. So that after the flight, the, the, the pilot will remove his camera, remove the SD uh, uh, card, and um, he'll, you know, replay um, He'll replay the, the 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 flight, or can put it on YouTube or, or whatever he wants to do. So that's the basic idea. Um, how it all goes together. It's um, fairly simple to actually build it. As we can see, there's just a few nuts and bolts that go together. We spoke about the wiring loom. We spoke about the motors and the propellers, the direction of these. We spoke about the accessories like the power, uh, um, you know, the voltage. We spoke about the receiver. We spoke about the flight controller. We spoke about the, the FPV transmitter and its antenna. And um, here's the RC receiver's antenna. There's the FPV camera. And that's what makes up a modern quadcopter. You know, apart from actually building it for you, um, the instructions are fairly simple and uh, we can provide much more detail on that. But those are the major components that make up a modern quadcopter. So um, thank you. Um, if there's any questions or anything, um, uh, um, please ask. And uh, I think we'll, we'll be able to um, assist you there. Do you have to know how to solder to do this? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, you have to have basic soldering skills. For instance, if you were to look at, um, you know, uh, uh, building a wiring loom like this, you would have to be able to solder this wire to those four wires. If you're not using a wiring loom and you use something like a, a, a um, you know, especially on the power side, if you're using a uh, power distribution board, you would need the ability to solder, you know, little wires to connectors like that. It's not crazy soldering. But, you know, again, if, if, if you look at this guy and, and, and you're going to go down to a 180 quadcopter or a smaller quadcopter, the size of these wires and components shrink. So, again, it's a good size to start with a 250 or 280 in this case, where the components are still pretty big and you can learn to. But it's only basic soldering skills you need. Yes, sir? Um, do you have to have a computer to yes. assemble? Well, you, not for assembly, but um, you would <laughs> most certainly want a computer to, to look at the, um, you know, uh, software and, and help forums and that kind of stuff. But to configure the flight controller, and that's this guy, the CC3D, if to configure this guy, typically it runs off, um, and you'll see a little USB port there. So there's a, a USB port and a USB cable. Um, it plugs in there, and that's how you connect it up to your computer. And with that, you'll be able to um, load new software and change configuration values on this controller via a uh, USB cable. So yes, a computer is a absolute must in this world. Um, <coughs> how how would you uh, what would you recommend to get started? So I built this. Got my soldering now. I got a program. Um, where should I start? Like, should I start my house? Should I start my backyard? Should I start uh, on a football field? Or in the woods? Yeah, yeah. The, the <laughs> yeah, the easiest place, honestly, to start is you. You probably do not want to do it in your house. First of all, a quadcopter like this can travel up to 60 miles an hour, and uh, I actually have dents in my bedroom roof. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, it's not a good place. Your backyard's also not Pretty good. Sure that's from the quad. That is from the quad. Uh, <laughs> uh, the backyard's also not a good place. I missed my neighbor's house by inches the first time I flew, so that's not a good place. The best place, quite honestly, is an open, deserted field way out there. You and your quadcopter, and you figure it out. Um, and that, and you take your little laptop with for configuration. And you, uh, you know, you, you go do it there, not the woods or anything like that. It would be an open field. Um, 
What about replacement parts? I mean, if you, if you, uh, you know, how often do I break it? How often do I repair it? And what do I normally need to repair? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the first quad I bought, I bought the extra two propellers. And within three minutes, I had broken both of it. And I was like, darn it. Now I broke two propellers. Today, I own in the excess of about 200 propellers, two to 300. That's the first thing you will break lots of, are propellers. These things are typically plastic, easy to break, but it's that way for a reason. They're very inexpensive, but without the propellers, you know, you're going to break lots of them. You're not going anywhere, right? You're not going anywhere, and you're going to break lots of them. That is the first thing you need lots of. And... Um, the second thing that typically breaks is, unfortunately, the frame does break depending on its, on its make and its composition. So that can break, but replacement parts are always available. Motors, all of the parts on you. Uh, I mean, you just go onto eBay or Amazon and you'll find the parts within a day. Um, so how many, you know, how many batteries would you suggest that I get? Yeah, to start off with, I would suggest getting at least three batteries at the absolute minimum. You know, if you look at a battery like this, it gives you about a five-minute flight time on a single battery. But, uh, um, you know, um, but it takes about an hour or two to charge. So if you only had one battery, you could fly for 15 minutes, or five minutes, sorry, um, and uh, charge for an hour. So you would at least need three batteries, so you can at least go fly for 15 minutes. And um, then, uh, um, so, but today, I, you know, I typically own about 20 batteries as standard. So I, I own a DJI Phantom, and I can fly for 15 minutes. Why, why can't I fly 15 minutes? Okay. Yeah, you know, a DJI Phantom is really a, a, a different kind of quadcopter. You'll see, first of all, of course, the propellers of the, on that is mu much bigger. And um, and uh, the, the motors are a, a you know built for efficiency rather than speed. A racing quadcopter like this is built for speed and agility, um, and thus they are much more power hungry. The second reason is the size of a battery. Uh, you know this guy typically a battery is this big. Um, on a quantum, or a phantom, the battery is much bigger. But the craft is also much bigger, you know, but it all depends on the weight ratio, you know, of course you can stick a big battery on there, but then you would hardly able to lift it because the battery weight would take away your efficiency. Um, so yes, a, a Phantom is a, is a different, it's built for efficiency, it's not built for racing. It cannot go 60 miles an hour around uh, uh, and under a a, you know, a tree or, or something like that. It's a filming quadcopter. Um, yeah, time for one more, maybe? Yes, yeah, one um, more. So I hear people talking about 3S and 4S batteries. Uh, can you just touch on that just briefly? Yeah, uh, all that that really means is the, uh, the amount of cells inside a battery. This one is a three cell. You see three cells. Each one of these cells produces at charge 4.2 volts or 3.7 nominal. So, um, of course, uh, if you have a four-cell battery, you're talking about 16 volts you're putting into your system. And a three-cell battery, you're talking about uh, 14 volts at fully charged. So that extra voltage, though, 16.8, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, that, that extra voltage, of course, can be used in the motors to turn them faster and uh, um, give more power and thrust to the machine. But it comes at a cost because you're carrying an extra... Um, uh, uh, um, cell um, that's extra weight. Well, thank you um, everybody for coming today. Uh, it was really, um, uh, you know, we, we can, um, you speak to Todd and myself on the way out. We're, we're here to, to help you. And um, thank you for, 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 for Todd and everybody for setting this up. And um, hope uh, you have a successful quad building experience. Yeah, we'll be giving away some of these kids um, 
um, uh, just to make uh, do the raffle or something. Yeah, like if if we if you want to do the raffle. So we'll um, do. Uh, then I'll go. I stop my recording. Um, um, so one thing I need to remember is we need to make sure we have the raffle QR code to put on the screen. Okay. Yep. Um, go back link. You know the short one. Mm-hmm.